Curious Dream by Mark Twain Containing a Moral Night before last, I had a singular dream. I seemed to be sitting on a doorstep, in no particular city perhaps, ruminating, and the time of night appeared to be about twelve or one o'clock. The weather was balmy and delicious. There was no human sound in the air, not a footstep. There was no sound of any kind to emphasize the dead stillness, except the occasional hollow barking of a dog in the distance, and even a fainter answer of the further dog. Presently, up the street, I heard a bony clack clacking, and guessed it was the castanets of a serenading party. In a minute more, a tall skeleton, hooded and half-clad in a tattered and moldy shroud, whose shreds were flapping about the ribby latticework of its person, swung by me with a stately stride and disappeared into the gray gloom of the starlight. It had broken and worm-eaten coffin on its shoulder and a bundle of something in its hand. I knew what the clack-clacking was then. It was this party's joints working together and his elbows knocking against his sides as he walked. I may say I was surprised. Before I could collect my thoughts and enter upon any speculations as to what this apparition might portend, I heard another one coming, for I recognized his click-clack. He had two-thirds of a coffin on his shoulder and some foot and headboards under his arm. I mightily wanted to peer under his hood and speak to him. But when he turned and smiled upon me with his cavernous sockets and his projecting grin as he went by, I thought I would not detain him. He was hardly gone when I heard the clacking again, and another one issued from the shadowy half-light. This one was bending under a heavy gravestone, and dragging a shabby coffin after him by a string. When he got to me, he gave me a steady look for a moment or two, and then rounded to and back up to me, saying, Ease this down for a fellow, will you? I eased the gravestone down till it rested on the ground, and in doing so noticed that it bore the name of John Baxter Cotmanhurst, with May 1839 as the date of his death. Deceased sat down warily by me and wiped his os frontis with his major maxillary. Chiefly from former habit, I judged, for I could not see that he brought away any perspiration. It is too bad, too bad, said he, drawing the remnant of the shroud about him and leaning his jaw pensively on his hand. Then he put his left foot up on his knee and fell to scratching his ankle bone absently with a rusty nail which he got out of the coffin. What is too bad, friend? Oh, everything. Everything. I almost wish I never had died. You surprise me. Why do you say this? Has anything gone wrong? What is the matter? Matter! Look at this shroud, rags. Look at this gravestone, all battered up. Look at that disgraceful old coffin. All a man's property going to ruin and destruction before his eyes, and ask him if anything is wrong? Fire and brimstone. Calm yourself, calm yourself, I said. It is too bad, it certainly is too bad. But then I had not supposed that you would mind such matters, situated as you are. Well, my dear sir, I do mind them. My pride is hurt, and my comfort is impaired. Destroyed, I might say. I will state my case. I will put it to you in such a way that you can comprehend it, if you will let me, said the poor skeleton, tilting the hood of his shroud back as if he were clearing for action, and thus unconsciously giving himself a jaunty and festive air, very much at variance with the grave character of his position in life, so to speak, and in prominent contrast to his distressful mood. Proceed, said I. I reside in the shameful old graveyard a block or two above you here in this street. There now, I just expected that cartilage would let go. Third rib from the bottom, friend. Hitch the end of it to my spine with a string, if you've got such a thing about you. Though a bit of silver wire is a deal pleasanter, and more durable and becoming. 
if one keeps it polished. To think of shredding out and going to pieces in this way, just on the account of the indifference and neglect of one's posterity. And the poor ghost grated his teeth in a way that gave me a wrench and a shiver, for the effect is mightily increased by the absence of muffling flesh and cuticle. I reside in that old graveyard, and have for these thirty years, and I tell you, Things are changed since I first laid this old, tired frame there, and turned over and stretched out for a long sleep, with a delicious sense upon me of being done with bother, and grief, and anxiety, and doubt, and fear, forever and ever, and listening with my comfortable and increasing satisfaction to the sexton's work, from the startling clatter of his first spadeful on my coffin, till it dulled away to the faint padding that shaped the roof of my new home. Delicious! My, I wish you could try it tonight! And out of my reverie, deceased fetched me a rattling slap with a bony hand. Yes, sir, thirty years ago I laid me down there and was happy, for it was out in the country then, out in the breezy, flowery, grand old woods. And the lazy winds gossiped with the leaves, and the squirrels capered over us and around us, and the creeping things visited us, and the birds filled the tranquil solitude with music. Ah, it was worth ten years of a man's life to be dead then. Everything was pleasant. I was in a good neighborhood, for all the dead people that lived near me belonged to the best families in the city. Our posterity appeared to think the world of us. They kept our graves in the very best condition. The fences were always in faultless repair. Headboards were kept painted or whitewashed, and were replaced with new ones as soon as they began to look rusty or decayed. Monuments were kept upright, railings intact and bright, the rose bushes and shrubbery trimmed, trained, and free from blemish, the walks clean and smooth and graveled. But that day is gone by. Our descendants have forgotten us. My grandson lives in this stately house built with money made by these old hands of mine, and I sleep in a neglected grave with invading vermin that gnaw on my shroud and build them nests withal. I and friends that lie with me founded and secured the prosperity of this fine city, and the stately bantling of our loves leaves us to rot in the dilapidated cemetery which neighbors curse and strangers scoff at. See the difference between the old time and this? For instance, our graves are all caved in now. Our headboards have rotted away and tumbled down. Our railings reel this way and that, with one foot in the air after a fashion of unseemly levity. Our monuments lean warily, and our gravestones bow their heads discouraged. There be no adornments any more. No roses, nor shrubs, nor graveled walks, nor anything that is a comfort to the eye. And even the paintless old board fence that did make a show of holding us sacred from companionship with the beasts and the defilement of heedless feet has tottered till it overhangs the street and only advertises the presence of our dismal resting place and invites yet more derision to it. And now we cannot hide our poverty and tatters in the friendly woods, for the city has stretched its withering arms abroad and taken us in. And all that remains of the cheer of our old home is the cluster of lugubrious forest trees that stand, bored and weary of city life, with their feet in our coffins, looking into the hazy distance and wishing they were there. I tell you, it is disgraceful. You begin to comprehend. You begin to see how it is. While our descendants are living sumptuously on our money, right around us in the city, we have to fight hard to keep skull and bones together. Bless you, there isn't a grave in our cemetery that doesn't leak, not one. Every time it rains in the night, we have to climb out and roost in the trees 
and sometimes we are awakened suddenly by the chilly water trickling down the backs of our necks. Then I tell you, there is a general heaving up of old graves and kicking over old monuments and scampering of old skeletons for the trees. Bless me, if you had gone along there some such nights after twelve, you might have seen as many as fifteen of us roosting up on one limb, with our joints rattling drearily and the wind wheezing through our ribs. Many a time we have perched there for three or four dreary hours, and then come down, stiff and chilled, through and drowsy, and borrowed each other's skulls to bail out our graves with. If you will glance up in my mouth now as I tilt my head back, you can see that my headpiece is half full of old dry sediment. How top-heavy and stupid it makes me sometimes. Yes, sir, a many time if you have happened to come along just before dawn, you'd have caught us bailing out our graves and hanging our shrouds on the fence to dry. Why, I had an elegant shroud stolen from there one morning think a party by the name of Smith took it that resides in a plebeian graveyard over yonder. I think so because the first time I ever saw him he hadn't anything on but a check shirt, and the last time I saw him, which was at a social gathering in the new cemetery, he was the best dressed corpse in the company. And it is a significant fact that he left when he saw me. And presently an old woman from here missed her coffin. She generally took it with her when she went anywhere because she was liable to take cold and bring on spasmatic rheumatism that originally killed her if she exposed herself to the night air much. She was named Hotchkiss, Anna Matilda Hotchkiss. You might know her. She has two upper front teeth, is tall, but a good deal inclined to stoop. One rib on the left side gone, has one shred of rusty hair hanging from the left side of her head, and one little tuft just above and a little forward of her right ear. Has her underjaw wired on one side where it has worked loose. Small bone of left forearm gone, lost in a fight. Has a kind of swagger in her gait and a gallus way of going out with her arms akimbo and her nostrils in the air. Has been pretty free and easy and is all damaged and battered up till she looks like a queensware crate in ruins. Maybe you have met her. God forbid, I involuntarily ejaculated, for somehow I was not looking for that form of question. And it caught me a little off my guard but I hastened to make amends for my rudeness and say, I simply meant I had not had the honor, for I would not deliberately speak discourteously of a friend of yours. You were saying that you were robbed, and it was a shame too, but it appears by what is left of the shroud you have on that it was a costly one in its day. How did... A most ghastly expression began to develop among the decayed features and shriveled entanglements of my guest's face and I was beginning to grow uneasy and distressed when he told me he was only working up a deep sly smile with a wink in it to suggest that about the time he acquired his present garment a ghost in a neighboring cemetery missed one. This reassured me, but I begged him to confine himself to speech thenceforth because his facial expression was uncertain. Even with the most elaborate care it was liable to miss fire. Smiling should especially be avoided. What he might honestly consider a shining success was likely to strike me in a very different light. I said I had liked to see a skeleton cheerful, even decorously playful, but I did not think smiling was a skeleton's best hold. Yes, friend, said the poor skeleton. The facts are just as I have given them to you. Two of these old graveyards, the one that I resided in and the one further along, have been deliberately neglected by our descendants of today until there is no occupying them any longer. Aside from the osteological discomfort of it, and that is no light matter in this rainy weather, the present state of things is ruinous to property. We have got to move or be content to see our effects wasted away and utterly destroyed. Now, you will hardly believe it, but it is true nevertheless that there isn't a single coffin in good repair among all my acquaintance? Now that is an absolute fact. I do not refer to low people who come in a pine box mounted on an express wagon, but I am talking about your high-toned silver-mounted burial case, your monumental sort, that travel under black plumes at the head of a procession and have choice of cemetery lots. I mean folks like the Jarvies and the Bledsoes and the Burlings and such. They're all about ruined. 
The most substantial people in our set they were, and now look at them. Utterly used up and poverty stricken. One of the Bledsoe's actually traded his monument to a late barkeeper for some fresh shavings to put under his head. I tell you it speaks volumes, for there is nothing a corpse takes so much pride in as his monument. He loves to read the inscription. He comes after a while to believe what it says himself, and then you may see him sitting on the fence night after night enjoying it. Epitaphs are cheap, and they do a poor chap a world of good after he is dead especially if he has had hard luck while he was alive. I wish they were used more. Now, I don't complain, but confidentially, I do think it was a little shabby of my descendants to give me nothing but this old slab of a gravestone, and all the more that there isn't a compliment on it. It used to have gone to his just reward on it, and I was proud when I first saw it. But by and by, I noticed that whenever an old friend of mine came along, he would hook his chin on the railing and pull a long face and read along down till he came to that, and then he would chuckle to himself and walk off, looking satisfied and comfortable. So I scratched it off and got rid of those fools. But a dead man always takes a deal of pride in his monument. Yonder goes half a dozen of the Jarvis now, with the family monument along, and Smithers and some hired specters went by with his a while ago. Hello, Higgins. Goodbye, old friend. That's Meredith Higgins. Died in 44. Belongs to our set in the cemetery. Fine old family. Great-grandmother was an Injun. I'm on the most familiar terms with him. He didn't hear me, and that was the reason why he didn't answer me. And I'm sorry, too, because I would have liked to introduce you. You would admire him. He was the most disjointed, swayed back, and generally distorted old skeleton you ever saw. But he's full of fun. When he laughs, it sounds like rasping two stones together, and he always starts it off with a cheery screech like raking a nail across a window pane. Hey, Jones! That's old Columbus Jones. Shroud costs four hundred dollars, and tired trousseau, including monument, twenty-seven hundred. This was in the spring of twenty-six. It was enormous style for those days. Dead people came all the way from the Alleghenies to see his things. The party that occupies the grave next to mine remembers it well. Now do you see that individual going along with a piece of headboard under his arm, one leg bone below his knee gone, and not a thing in the world on? That is Barstow Dalhousie, and next to Columbus Jones he was the most sumptuously outfitted person that ever entered our cemetery. We are all leaving. We cannot tolerate the treatment we are receiving at the hands of our descendants. They open new cemeteries, but they leave us to our ignominy. They mend the streets, but they never mend anything that is about us or belongs to us. Look at that coffin of mine. Yet I tell you in its day it was a piece of furniture that would have attracted attention in any drawing room in this city. You may have it if you want it. I can't afford to repair it. Put a new bottom in her and part of a new top, and a bit of fresh lining along the left side, and you'll find her about as comfortable as any receptacle of her species you ever tried. No thanks. No, don't mention it. You have been civil to me, and I would give you all the property I've got before I would seem ungrateful. Now this winding sheet is kind of a sweet thing in its way if you would like to. No? Well, just as you say, but I wish to be fair and liberal. There's nothing mean about me. Goodbye, friend. I must be going. I may have a good way to go tonight. Don't know. I only know one thing for certain, and that is that I am on the emigrant trail now, and I'll never sleep in that crazy old cemetery again. I will travel till I find respectable quarters, if I have to hoof it to New Jersey. All the boys are going. It was decided at a public conclave last night to emigrate, and by the time the sun rises there won't be a bone left in our old habitations. Such cemeteries may suit my surviving friends, but they do not suit the remains that have the honor to make these remarks. My opinion is the general opinion. If you doubt it, go see how the departing ghosts upset before they started. They were almost riotous in their demonstrations of distaste. Hello, here come some of the Bledsoe's, and if you will give me a lift with this tombstone, I guess I will join company and jog along with them. 
mighty respectable family, the Bledsoes, and used to always come out in six-horse hearses and all that sort of thing fifty years ago when I walked these streets in daylight. Goodbye, friend. And with his gravestone on his shoulder, he joined the grisly procession, dragging his damaged coffin after him, for notwithstanding he pressed it upon me so earnestly I utterly refused his hospitality. I suppose that for as much as two hours these sad outcasts went clacking by, laden with their dismal effects, and all the time I sat pitying them. One or two of the youngest and least dilapidated among them inquired about midnight trains on the railways, but the rest seemed unacquainted with that mode of travel, and merely asked about common public roads to various towns and cities, some of which are not on the map now, and vanished from it and from the earth as much as thirty years ago. And some few of them never had existed anywhere but on maps, and private ones in real estate agencies at that. And they asked about the condition of the cemeteries in these towns and cities, and about the reputation the citizens bore as to reverence for the dead. This whole matter interested me deeply, and likewise compelled my sympathy for these homeless ones. And it all seeming real, and I not knowing it was a dream, I mentioned to one shrouded wanderer an idea that had entered my head to publish an account of this curious and very sorrowful exodus, but said also that I could not describe it truthfully, and just as it occurred, without seeming to trifle with a grave subject and exhibit an irreverence for the dead that would shock and distress their surviving friends. But this bland and stately remnant of a former citizen leaned him far over my gate and whispered in my ear and said, Do not let that disturb you. The community that can stand such graveyards as those we are emigrating from can stand anything a body can say about the neglected and forsaken dead that lie in them. At that very moment a cock crowed, and the weird procession vanished and left not a shred or a bone behind. I awoke and found myself lying with my head out of the bed and sagging downward considerably, a position favorable to dreaming dreams with morals in them, maybe, but not poetry. Note. The reader is assured that if the cemeteries in his town are kept in good order, this dream is not leveled at his town at all, but is leveled particularly and venomously at the next town. End of A Curious Dream by Mark Twain